Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It's a good morning. Nice day outside. We come before you this morning in prayer and thanking God for what you've done for us. I went to a funeral on Thursday. One of my homegirls passed. Got a call this morning. Robert Hawkins passed from Annapolis. He comes down here every once in a while. And Pastor Calvin Franklin passed on Thursday. Now those are the ones that I know have passed, but I know they're passing about maybe every one every six minutes. But we just want to just give praise to God for allowing us to be here to this day. And this little song is in commemoration of those who have gone on before us and those who will go. another Sunday morning and the old church would say I'm glad about it so glad to be in the number one more time thank God for each of you who are sitting around your televisions your computers telephones however it is that we come into your 
home and into your life. We thank you for tuning in this morning, and we pray God's richest blessings upon each of you. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, I come now to tell you thank you again. Thank you for all of your blessings, Lord. We, we know that things aren't as well as perhaps we'd like them to be, but you're still God. And we thank you for still being in your will because we're still here. There are many who have uh, been raptured already, already gone to glory, Lord. We look around and another one is gone. Reverend Bentley talked about several this morning who have left us very recently. And we've got church members who are in hospitals now. And I want to pray a special blessing upon Sister Lena Pelt this morning, God, asking you to heal her body. Heal her body, God, and send her back home. We thank you for all of our members, all of our friends who are gathered around this morning, and we pray, God, that you'll touch their families wherever they may be. Let, our, let us all know, Lord, that time is winding up, that we don't know where death is, and we know that you're still God, and you're calling the roll. So, God, I pray that each one of us would make some preparations now while we have an opportunity, while blood still runs warm through our veins, Lord, that we too will be prepared when that day come and when we hear your call and we have to answer. Now, Lord, it's preaching time and you're the preacher. I'm asking your Father if you'll take charge of my mortal frame now, that you'll take charge of my mind, my body, and my soul and all that's within me, Lord. Use me to your glory today. Speak to me and through me as you open the minds, the hearts, and the ears of these, your people who are listening, I pray, Lord, that you'll help them to hear and receive and be doers of all that they hear from your voice this morning out of heaven. So, God, I ask you to preach now. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Again, I thank you for being with us. Thank my musicians. One of them, Lord, they, they, they are doing what they can for you. Thank Reverend Bentley for that song this morning. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you'll just keep us in your will. Uh, times are a little different from what we're accustomed to, but it doesn't make you God any less. And we just thank you for our still being here. And I pray that we'll be able to hear your call and hearken unto your voice while we still can. This morning, there is a word, and the word is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25. I'm going to read verses 29 through mm, 36, or 19 through 36. Uh, chapter, chapter 25, St. Matthew's 25. Beginning at verse mm, Okay, let's let me go back a little bit. Okay. Matthew chapter twenty five. I might want to back that up just a little bit. Hang on with me, just bear with me a minute or two here. Let's go back to verse 14 and, and read from there. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and another one, and to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made five other talents. And likewise, he that received two gained two others, but he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servant cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought the other five talents, saying, Lord, thou delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained Besides them, five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, 
thy good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And he also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou delivered unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents besides them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, a good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I, 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 knew, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where they hadn't sown anything and gathering where thou hast not strolled. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast thou is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reaped where I didn't sow and gathered where I didn't strow. Thou oughtest therefore have put my money into the exchange, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to him which has ten talent. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he has. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen. I, I just read a long way, so uh, pray that uh, the reading of this word has been edifying to your soul as we go forth into this passage of scripture and try and reckon with it as the Lord gives us utterance. Today, for just a few moments, I want to speak to you from the subject pride, P-R-I-D-E. Pride. It's Black History Month. This is the first Sunday of, uh, of this very short month, and we're going to do as the Lord has uh, blessed us to be able to do, and I'm going to ask you to have some pride in yourself. If you don't have anything else, have some pride. I don't think that that's real bad. I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Well, we're going to talk about this for just a little bit. Success makes us proud, I think. Success does. Makes us proud. And believe it or not, success can be found in a whole lot of different places. Different arenas. On yesterday, I was wondering what I was going to talk about today and I, I, I kind of ran into this movie that's entitled the same thing as my title this morning. The movie's title is Pride. It's a movie that's, that stars uh, Terrence Howard and, and, and Bernie Mac. Y'all know these guys. They've been around a long time. This movie, Pride, was, it, it takes place in 1974. A time when life wasn't easy for the black male. Now, there isn't a whole lot of difference between 74 and 2021. Anything other than years. A whole lot of years, but it's the same story, primarily. It wasn't easy then, and it's not easy now. Even for a college-educated uh, uh, Jim Ellis, who was played by... Uh, Terrence Howard. Yeah, he, he was a fellow who had did everything that he was supposed to do and couldn't find a job. Struggling to find anything was going to be better than what he had because he didn't have nothing. So Jim, this former competitive swimmer, accepts the job of dismantling this decrepit Marcus Foster Recreation Center that was operated by the Philadelphia Department of Recreation. Now, I know some of you have seen this movie, and if you hadn't, you might want to see if you can pull it up. Uh, you can find it in several of those spots where they keep the movies. Y'all know where they're on those smart TVs. So, the center, uh, this, this Department of Recreation Center, included this rundown swimming pool, which Ellis rehabilitates. Ellis's presence and activities cause frictions 
with this bitter, overprotective janitor who was named Elston. This guy was played by Bernie Mac. Y'all, y'all, I hope you you've seen it. So one day, Jim invites this group of black teens who had just been thrown off the basketball court because the department came out and took down the basketball goal. They had nowhere else to play. So, 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 so Jim invites these teenagers into the rec center for a nice swim. Well, Andre and Hakeem and, and Reggie and you know everybody got, a, got, got somebody in the group with a, with a nickname, so they call this guy Puddinghead. Invited, invited him and Walt, and, and they proved to be some pretty capable swimmers. With a few pointers, they could be some excellent swimmers. So with help from Elston, Jim decides to try to save this public swimming pool by starting the city's first African-American swim team. When the team also acquires this, this young girl named Willie, girl named Willie, all right? A swimmer that was more gifted than any of the boys. So the prospect of competing against the more experienced rival teams became real positive at this point. And throughout the team struggle, in and out of the pool, Jim, Jim embraces and he mentors these kids, helping them to become successful at, at swimming, not only swimming, but the struggles that they were going through with the prejudice in the city and the crime and the poverty. <clears throat> That's always the case. So this great film, along with other favorites, you, 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 you know some of them, and I want you to go back sometime during this month because we watch so many other films from all other ethnic groups. We need to take some time to see what we are doing in our own ethnicity. And this month ought to be a good, good month to, to look at movies like Remembering the Titans and Glory Road and Men of Honor and Gifted Hands and The Great Debate and the Tuskegee Airmen and The Express and, and, and you know you know many of the movies. Just go back and, and, and see if you can't pull some of those up on, on your Netflix and, and whatever other uh, flicks y'all got on your TVs. <laughs> yeah, so you can, you can see regardless to what side of the railroad tracks you were born on, that can be success coming from anywhere. Anybody can have some pride because pride is built. I want y'all to hear me today. It doesn't make any difference about where you were born, what your family situation is, how you view yourself or how others view you today in this word that I just read to you a little while ago, I want to show you that God has given everybody all that we need to be successful in this life and to inherit the kingdom to come. And I think that this word can do it today. So I ask you to pray with me and pray for me as we, as we go through here that we can get an understanding of what God expects of us. First of all, he... he it, we got to understand that the more we let our little light shine, the more credit that we can give to God, the more God, the, the more glory that God is going to get out of our lives, and the higher we're going to ascend in the spiritual realm. But as we ascend in the spiritual realm, somebody in the physical realm is going to watch us because somebody is already watching you. And he's going to see or she's going to see exactly what it is that you're doing and whatever it is that you're doing, they too are going to want to emulate it because you look pretty good doing it. Now, God gives all of us opportunities. Verse 19. So we need to prepare ourselves for whatever the process is. It says, after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckon with them. That's what it says, verse 19. In order for success to be born, there has to be a need. Now, 
God creates need. Watch this. If you hadn't been needed here, you wouldn't be here. So when you got here, you were already a winner. Hear what I tell you. When you were conceived, there were hundreds, perhaps even thousands of other little sperms who were racing with you to the conception spot. Y'all with me? But you outran every last one of them. Your mother conceived. You were born. You are the winner. You were placed on this earth in the protective care of parents. Now, whether those parents actually raised you or whether you were raised by an auntie and an uncle, a grandma, a grandpa, or somebody from some foster care, it doesn't matter. You are still here. You're a winner. There had to be a need for you, so God saw the need for you to be here, and there's something that he wants you to do while you're here. God provided the three necessities of life, food, clothing, and shelter. He provided those for you. And then secondly, in order for you to succeed in being born, you had to be cultivated. Cultivated. You're here. You're being provided for. You have a job. Cultivating your mind. Got the food that God provides for you is going to cultivate your body. It's going to keep you growing. But your mind has to be grown. Timothy said, uh, Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and 15, study to show thyself approved, a workman under God. Not a shame, but rightfully. Divide into it. Now, if, 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 if Paul said to Timothy that he needed to study, he also said to you and I that we need to study. We can't, we can't make it in this world if you don't do something to enhance what it is that God has already blessed you with. That's your job. All of the tools have been put in place for you to be able to make it in this life. There are schools. There are some schools that are better than those schools. And then there are some schools that are better than those schools. And you got a choice as to which school you actually go to. You can go to the secular schools, public schools, public colleges, state colleges, or you go to some private ones. It doesn't matter. But you need to study you got to learn how to read and write. You got to learn how to interpret whatever it is that's written. But then there's the other school. There's a secular, uh, 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 sacred school. You can get that right here with me. Because I'm going to read the scriptures to you. you. You need to know the word of God. And that's what Paul was telling Timothy. You need to rightly divide these words. You need to rightly interpret them so that you can apply them to your life. Study. Cultivate your mind as well as your body. So that you can, at some point, they say 18 now, is the cutoff for daddy to have to not worry about seeing about you no more. <laughs> you get 18 years old, you're basically on your own. Now, if you watch nature, You've seen the birds. You see every spring. You see these little, these little little, little birds that nest anywhere. They'll nest in your flower pot. And they'll, they'll have two or three little eggs, and then look like 10, 15 days they're gone. Got the egg left, but the bird is gone. You don't ever see a mother bird running around with two or three birds on her back. That means that those birds grew up. She fed them until they were big enough to start fending for themselves. We need to take a lesson from that. Here we are, 40, 50 years old, still living in mom and daddy's house. It's time for you to get up out of there. You're a grown man, grown woman. It's 
time for you to see about yourself. Mom and dad ain't going to be here forever seeing about you. When I turned 17 years old, I had five sisters and brothers who were still eating at the same table that I was eating at. And uh, mama had plenty of food, but the house was getting a little crowded because everybody was growing up. I graduated high school and I, I left. And I ain't been back. That's been a long time ago. But mama taught me that I had to make it on my own. Cultivate it. Learn whatever it is that the teachers are teaching you while you, are ha while you have that opportunity to get it for free and it doesn't cost you anything so that you can get out and become productive. Pay some taxes. Light that load on my back. Help me out, somebody. Thirdly, in order for success to be born, it has to go through some roadblocks. Now, I'm, 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 I'm trying not to let this become a long time with me today. Because I know y'all got a Super Bowl game that you want to see, and I don't want to hold you here all day. But let me see if I can break this down and do it in a way that everybody's going to fully get this. Roadblocks. There are obstacles. Every day has its own issues. Every day. When you wake up in the morning, open your eyes, the sun shining, your mind start ticking. You're already painting the picture of what this day is going to be like. You know that there is something going to go wrong somewhere that's going to cost you some of your time. The only thing that you can't get back in life is time. Once it's gone, it's gone forever. Roadblocks. First one, since it's African American History Week, you were born black. I don't have to tell you how big a roadblock that has been over the last 400 years. But it doesn't matter about how big an obstacle that's been because our God is bigger than the obstacle. He didn't bring us this far to leave us. There are always going to be things that are going to set us back, but we can't ever stop moving forward. You got to persevere. I could tell you the story of of the man and his daughter who were going through the rain and after, after, after she got off in the middle of the rainstorm and she said, Daddy, can I stop? Do I need to stop? She said, keep going. And she asked him about two or three times because the rain was blinding him and he said, keep going. And then when he got on the other side of the rain, he said, look back. If he had stopped in it, you'd still be in it. The whole point is that we are just going through. We didn't come here to stay. Since I'm not going to tell you about that story, I'm going to tell you the one about the butterfly. That's the one I'm going to tell you. You know, in the spring of the year and in the summer, these little worms, little fuzzy worms, little caterpillar worms, they, they crawl all over the place. You'll be trying to get rid of them, but eventually they'll stop. They'll, they'll crawl up on something and just stop, and you'll see in a few days this cocoon. And you know that the butterfly, I mean the worm went in the butter, went into the cocoon, right? And if you watch that cocoon long enough, you'll see it start to grow in. And if you watch it till it gets just about to the end of the growth cycle, you'll see the cocoon start to move. Now, the interesting thing about this is that that worm is going through what we call metamorphosis. He's changing into something totally different from what he used to be. That's cultivating. Y'all working with me? This worm inside of this cocoon is, is working. He's, he's trying to get out of this cocoon, but he ain't strong enough yet. Now, you could go and and help that worm out of that cocoon if you'd like. You can get your, get, your, get your razor blade like one little boy did. And, and he had broken the stick off that the cocoon was on and 
His cocoon was kept moving, and his mama kept telling him, boy, don't bother the cocoon. Just leave it alone. He'll come out of there when it's time. But the little boy didn't see the picture. He, he was thinking that he can't get out. So he helped it out. He got him a little scissor, and he clipped a little hole in it, and opened it up, and the little thing fell out on the floor. And he showed it to his mama. And he said, Mama, it's just lying here wiggling. It won't fly. You said a butterfly was in there. She said, Son, you, you've killed it. It's going to die because it'll never fly. Now, you, you've helped it to get out. And that's not the purpose of the cocoon. The purpose of the cocoon is to be an obstacle for this worm turning into a butterfly. He has to agitate. He has to push to strengthen up his wings so that when he come out of there, he can fly. Right. Yeah. You've hindered him. That one will never fly. And that's what we do to some of our children. We, we turn them into invalids because we don't push them out of the nest. We opened the cocoon and here we got what we got. It'll never fly. When the obstacles come, God send them into our lives so that they make us stronger. We got to go through something in order to understand the power of God. He didn't bring us this far to leave us. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. From the Father of the heavenly lights. That's what James 1 and 17 says. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. God continues to bless us every day. So he gives us talents. Talents. Buck's talent is play that guitar. He play it too. Lord, it must I like listening to that boy. And Harold back there, Lord, it must that great boy get to thumping on that bass back there. Dum, 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 dum. And I can't help but to sit here and move, you know. And Nate get to leaning on that, leaning on that organ over there. And my Lord, what a what a noise. What a an awesome noise. And Velma just keeps pace. Doom, 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 doom. Lord have mercy. Talents. Everybody got their own talent. And God has blessed us like that. You know, uh, Paul, Paul talks about the body itself. Uh, how the hand is not the foot and the hand can't do what the eyeballs do. <laughs> Everybody has their own thing. You got your thing. I got my thing. You know, you might be able to preach. But you might be able to preach a whole lot better than me. I just do what the Lord told me to do. But that's my thing. I have my talent. You have your talent. So what we need to do is focus on the positive ways that we can use our talents. God has been good to us. He blessed us with these gifts. And we need to use them for the positive things. That's what, that's what Terrence uh, did in that movie last night. Pride. He used what he had, what God had blessed him with. He, he was a swimmer. And he transferred those talents over to five or six other kids who became swimmers. If each one teach one, the positives that you go through in your life, I think that every last one of us are going to be the, a whole lot better off. Use what God has blessed you with in a positive way. God has given everybody the choices. We got choices. We can, we can choose to do it right or wrong, good or bad, upside down, Right side up, however you want to do it. But I'm going to choose to do as best I can 
because somebody is going to emulate me whether I do it right or wrong. Secondly, we need to focus on the people who are going to be blessed by our success. You know, Sunday morning when this when this when this musical orchestra gets together over here in this corner, these four folks, everybody out there who hear them start feeling this presence of the Holy Spirit. And I know that you feel it because I feel him right here in this chair. I sit here and I and I and I think, Lord, you must be in this place. Whenever you know, it, it was the same way back when I was a little boy. And I could, I could hear my grandmama in that kitchen. I get to smelling something, and I hear her humming. <laughs> Lord, you must be present in this kitchen. <laughs> some good coming in here. There's always goodness where the presence of the Lord is. So, 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 so we have to, we have to focus, focus ourselves on, on doing good. Focus on the right way to achieve whatever successes that we, that we go through. Focus on the right way. You know, there are a lot of, a lot of ways that we could make a living in this world. <laughs> For the females, there, there, there's one that we call the oldest, oldest, what was it real? Oldest profession, that's the word. <laughs> Been around a long time. Nobody ever said it was the right way to make a living. They just call it the oldest profession. Now, if you think about it, all of us can go out and find something that we can do to earn a living wage. And what we do, sometimes it might last for 30, 40 years, long enough to retire and get a check from it from now on. But for some of us, we'll go out there and we'll do it for six or eight months and we'll feel like it ain't moving fast enough for us and we need to take something from somebody. So we start moving things around so we can sell off a little something to get rich quick. There's no such thing as a get rich quick. When God took Adam and Eve out of the garden, he said, by the sweat of your brow will you eat. So we got to give a fair day's labor for a fair day's wage. You expect to get paid, then work. Yeah. Working will keep you out of the penitentiary. Giving a fair day's labor will actually get you moved up in your workplace. People pay attention to what you're doing. If you're slothful, like that third guy that I talked about in our scripture, that, that slothful servant, lazy and slothful servant. Give me what you got. Give me back what, what I gave you. Get away from me because I don't want to be bothered with you. That's how life is. God gives all of us free will. We should never be afraid to choose success over failure. That's in that same verse, verse 25. I'm going to bury my money in the ground. Are you serious? I, if Buck gave me $100 and asked me to, 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 to go and invest it for him, I might lose Buck's money, but I'm going to show invest it. <laughs> Did y'all hear what I said? I might lose it, Harold, but I'm going to invest it. I am not going to put it in the ground because I know in the ground I don't even have a chance to win. <laughs> if I put it in the money market, Go and buy hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin, <laughs> or a hundred dollars worth of Apple, or hundred dollars worth of anything. Yeah, it might go down. It might not be worth a hundred dollars when he come back at it. But whatever it's worth is worth that because at least I tried. That's 
the whole thing right there. I tried. I can hold my head up and have a sense of pride when I face him because I gave it my best. Don't be afraid of failure on your way to success. We're going to win some. We might lose some. And I know some of y'all sitting out there right now with your money in your pocket thinking that, thinking that, uh, that, 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 that one football team is going to be better than the other one today. <laughs> and I got my money on the right one, right? Okay. Somebody's going to win. Somebody's going to lose. <laughs> but you stand a chance. <laughs> At least you stand a chance. <laughs> That's not to say that gambling is the right thing to do. <laughs> but somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. Secondly, I'm, 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 I'm rushing. I'm rushing toward an end. Don't be afraid of the hard work that's required to gain success. I mentioned that just a few minutes ago. Don't be afraid to, to fail. Don't be afraid to win. And in closing, don't be afraid of the rewards that come from success. Sometimes some of us can't stand to succeed. Some of us don't like money. Now, I'm not arguing with anybody who doesn't fell in love with money because there's a difference. The scripture says that the love of money is the beginning of evil. Now, when that scripture is, is quoted, I always think about people who fall in love with money and just like to see it sitting in the bank. Open your bank book four or five times a day to make sure that it's, your, you know, your $650,000 still there. And tomorrow we want to make sure that it's, you know, $656,000 or $51,000 or whatever it is. But you just like for it to sit there. You ain't going to do nothing with it. You just want it there. That's loving money. But when you treat your success like God intended for you to treat your success, you will never go broke even if you ain't got but $150 in the bank. God takes care of his own. It's a God thing. It ain't about you and your money. I'm closing now. We got to remember to live our lives with pride. 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 Put yourself in a positive position. That's the P in pride right now. Put yourself in a positive position. How do you do that? You put God first. Whatever it is that you're going to do, put God first. If God gave you a gift, don't you know that God is going to see to it that you succeed in whatever it is that you do as long as he is first in your life? Put God first. Rid yourself of negative people and things. Ara. Right. Rid yourself of negative people and things. Some of us got people around us who just got bad spirits. And they're dragging on us because you're caught up in their tangled web. And you're dragging along with them trying to change them. You can't change nobody. What makes you think you can change them and God can't change them? You need to cut that string right now. Get you some scissors or a knife or something, clip it off. If your hand is holding or they holding on to you, get you a hammer or something and break it loose. Let that go because it's dragging you back. It's holding you back. It's, it's like an anvil around your neck. Let it go. God loves you and he want to see about you. Make sure that you can succeed. You can't help nobody until you help yourself. Rid yourself of negative people and things. Sometimes we got things in our life. 
You know, I bought a, I bought a Thunderbird one time. Must have been about a 76, 77 Thunderbird. It was in the 80s. Had one of them great big engines in it, but it was pretty. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty. Two the old white Thunderbird. Beautiful car. Every time I went to the store in or the anywhere, when it got back to the house, I had to spend $400 in it to keep it going. <laughs> Before I could ride again. It finally occurred to me that that thing was killing me. It was like a cancer. And finally, somebody stopped by the house and asked me about buying it. I wanted to tie a $100 bill to it and give it to them. <laughs> but I sure took his money. I had to get rid of that thing. It was pretty. Back then, I wasn't married. I was coding. I had old gal that loved to ride in it. But we couldn't go far. <laughs> Besides that, I think it got about six or eight miles to the gallon book. <laughs> Woo! And I was broke. You know, young men don't have much money. <laughs> have mercy. Get rid of the negative things and people out of your life. I'm about done. That's, 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 that's the R. The I. Invest in your gifts. Whatever your gift is, work on it. Just keep working on it. Because if you love it enough to do it for free, you can make money doing it. Did you hear what I said? If you love what you do enough to do it for free, you can always make money at it because somebody else is watching you. And they will pay you to teach them what you do. Invest in your gift. D, develop positive relationships. Your first relationship outside of your family needs to be God because it's he that you need to follow all of your life. Wherever he goes, you be with him. You tell him, Lord, if I drop your hand, you just hold on to me because I need you. I can't do this without you. You need to, you need to have God with you at all times. And then you need to collaborate with people who have your best interest at heart. People who are like-minded. People who are wanting something out of life. Too often we get to collaborating with folks that don't want nothing, ain't going to ever turn into nothing, ain't going to be nothing, don't want nothing, none of that. And here I am caught up with it. No! Let it go! Stay with people who are positive, got your interests at heart, and finally exercise your faith and expect greatness. P-R-I-D-E, pride. Exercise your faith and expect greatness. Whatever I've accomplished in this lifetime, I accomplished it because God was with me. I accomplished it because I knew. I've, I'd seen God working in my life since I was a little boy. And I just believe that anything I ask of God, that he was going to do it for me. I believe that today. And it must be true because he just keep on doing it. I exercise my gift of faith. I, I don't know why I believe this, but I believe that if I was in the middle of the ocean and fell out the boat, I could walk on water. Now, I might not. But I believe I could because my faith is like that. If I can't walk on the water and God going to send me a fish that I can ride on his back back to the shore, he going to get me out about that some kind of way because every time I fall, he picked me up. Every time. He hadn't failed me yet. Now, back when I was young, dumb, and stupid, I did some things that, you know, like most of us do at some point in life, walked away from the Lord for a little while, but it didn't take me long to realize after I got broke that I needed the Lord. And every time I needed him, he was there. He was there. I was, I was telling somebody very recently about an experience that I had when I was in the Philippines. I was, I was stuck there for about three, four months, I guess. And, 
and I had run out of money. And uh, over in Subic Bay, they had a, they had a, they had a, they had these little casinos. It's been a long time ago. They were stuck in little buildings, little one of them bandit things. Now I didn't play that. I ain't never liked that because I like my money better than I like gambling. But I had been eating uh, mangoes for two or three days. <laughs> that was all I had to eat with mangoes. There was a mango tree out there close to where I lived. And I was working on the mangoes. I was sick of mangoes. And I think I had two or three nickels. I didn't have many. And it wasn't enough to go and buy a meal, so I went over to that casino. And I dropped them over in that little bucket, in that little uh, casino thing. And I pulled a handle, and I had about $22 to fall out of there. Now, ain't nobody going to ever convince me because I don't play that. I don't do that. Nobody will ever be able to convince me that God didn't give me them $22. That was American money over there, and the exchange rate was about 23 to 1. I was flat rich. <laughs> I had enough money to last me until the boat came back because I understood how to ration it at that point. I knew that eating was more important than anything else that I could do, and I made sure I had enough money to eat every day, and I wasn't putting none of that money back in that machine, not one nickel. <laughs> well, I pray that your pride will stand up regardless to whatever else happens during your life as black folk, because I know we go through some challenges. I've been through them. I've had folks to say some things to me that were real ugly. Things that I'd never repeat again anywhere. But that's all right because God had my back even then. Coach Ellis and, and his swim team, this bunch of misfits that I told you about in my opening, they went on to become a championship swimming team because he instilled into them the same thing that our mothers and our grandfathers in the church has instilled into us from day one. They have given us the moral values that we needed to be able to, to do the things that we need to do the proper way. They've given us the ethics that we need to keep as we go through life, not taking anything, but giving back to whomever it is that needs something in whatever it is that they're going through. We don't know what God blessed us with all this money for, but somebody needs some of it every once in a while. I'm not going to take anything from you if I don't need it. I ain't going to ask you for nothing, but if you ask me, you obviously need it. If I come to you, I obviously need it. And I'm going to treat you just like you treat me. I'm going to give love I'm going to give you whatever I got in my pocket that I can help you with to make your life a little bit better. And I'm going to do it with pride because I feel like that's what God would have me to do. That's my sense of pride. It don't matter which side of the tracks you were born on. Your mind wasn't conditioned by the color of your skin. Dr. King said that a long time ago, and I stick with that one. That's one of the quotes that's always been in my mind. I don't care who you are. You ain't no better than me. God, God never said that I needed to be your slave. I've conditioned my mind to believe that I can do whatever it is that you're doing better than you can do it. If you're an entrepreneur, don't lay in the bed until half the day is gone and then think you can get up and make a living. You need to get up earlier than the man who's running the factory because your wealth depends on it. But if you got God before you, you can do the same thing that I do. Take pride and following the, the, the expertise and the wisdom of our forefathers. They knew that God would see them through. They just knew that. They knew that the day was going to come when, 
when Coach Bentley would come over here and start teaching school and showing folks how to play basketball and teaching folks how to go on to make real living somewhere else on a different platform only with, the, with the basketball and with the stuff that he was teaching. He, he's, he's done the same thing for you and your families. God has blessed every last one of us with something that we can be real proud of. And don't tell me that you're not proud when your child leave your house and go out and, and does something that's exceptional, that he can be acknowledged on the grand scale for. God wants us to be proud of what we do so that he can be proud of what we do. And the greatest thing that brings him pride is when we start telling somebody else about how good he's been to us. Has he been good to you? Think about it for a minute or two. Just think about all of the times that he brought you through things that you didn't know you were going to be able to make it through. The time when you were almost in jail. The time when you were so sick that you didn't think you'd ever get well. The time that your child was in trouble. You were wondering how you were going to get it out. It was God. It was God. God wants to be proud of you. And you make him proud by telling somebody else about your experiences. Jesus hung, bled, and died so that we'd have the right to the tree of life abundantly. He's done all that he's going to do. He's opened it up so that you and I can inherit eternal life and live good in this world. But we got to accept what it is that he has for us and cultivate it. There is a need. We got to fight the roadblocks. Make it through anyway. Agitate your way through. Black lives do matter. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you now. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this wonderful message this morning of pride and how proud you've been of us. Not to give up in the midst of the fight because we knew that you were there and it was you who brought us through. We didn't see our way through the Red Sea, but you opened it up. We didn't see our way across the old muddy Jordan, but you opened it up. We didn't see our way from the cotton fields, but you brought us through. You even put us in the White House. And you're still blessing us right now. And I thank you. Thank you for the pride that we feel in ourselves of knowing that our votes count and that they matter and that you are making a way for us, with us, and through us right now for the next generation. Bless us to be good examples that we might be proud of the kids that we raise in the generation to come. I bless you now, Lord. I thank you, and I'll continue to praise you and lift you up. I love you. I thank you for all that you do for us. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. Pray that you got something out of what we've talked about here this morning. I love you. There ain't nothing you can do about that. <laughs>